Well, hello. Welcome to the High Speeds Live class. We're going to get started with some common words, and this also focuses on vowel practice. Here we go. Ready? Jake, lot, ho, tap, slate, sleek, vein, pump, hit, hike, beat, fuel, row, break, rut, shut, fight, see, wear, fit, sky, meet, met, skit, fade, fad, bore, bone, back, break, bake, bus, club, mule, screw, puff, splice, pie, pill, still, strip, stripe, kept, sleet, style, still, stripe, dude, dud, dumb, fuse, like, lick, luck, bud, plum, plume, plump, ban, rude, rud, steak, stark, pale, blow, rain, ran, pal, pale, blot, bloat, soap, sot, dote, dot, sop, rote, rot, fat, fate, cat, kate, cane, drip, kit, kite, dean, din, fire, fur, red, jeep, par, pear, jet, rip, ripe, news, glue, bowl, buff, tough, prey, peak, peck, deer, cue. <clears throat> All right, now my next set of words focus on word endings. So we're going to hear words that end with final BL, final BD, final NT, final ND, final RT, final RS, final RM, final RN. Here we go, here are your words. Just date this, here we go. Bubble, robbed, double, rubbed, trouble, stabbed, able, grabbed, gobble, ribbed, fable, tabbed, table, nabbed, stable, sobbed, sable, cubed, dribble, mobbed, wobble, blab, blabbed, hobble, lobbed, bent, bend, rent, rend, meant, mend, lent, lend, Pant, mind, hint, rind, dent, find, want, wand, lent, end, sent, sand, jaunt, signed, haunt, bend, hurt, hearse, flirt, course, cart, purse, mart, nurse, pert, parse, shirt, farce, dart, terse, dirt, curse, wart, force, sort, worse, smart, fierce, chart, sparse, arm, iron, charm, learn, farm, fern, warm, turn, berm, spurn, norm, corn, firm, darn, harm, worn, term, thorn, warm, or excuse me, worm, stern, sperm, burn, swarm, yarn. All right, moving into Tangle Tamers. Here we go. Ready? Clandestine rendezvous, bodily injury, licensed auctioneer, questioned credibility, electrical impulses, corrective lenses, exceptionally long-standing, correction inevitable, initial assessment, view-oriented homes, ombudsman condemnation, gracious entertaining, recreational vehicle, obsolete guardhouse, pot scrubber dishwashers, controversial reauthorization, future reconciliation, luxurious oval tubs, covered porches, behavior modification, 
sense and sensibility, sensitive statement, louver draperies, outpatient facilities, unusual friendships, paraplegic equipment, terribly confusing, high profile, fresh architecture, colorless environment, swayed precariously, beleaguered correspondence, striking in impression, foreign secretaries, illegal immigrants, home builder extraordinaire. All right. Now I've got some sentences that focus on numbers. Here we go. The bill was $34 and something, I don't remember. The contents of the purse included a $100 bill and several $5 bills. Did you say $8,500 or $9,500? The suspect was carrying a brown bag which contained a stack of 20s and a stack of 50s. We originally planned to give him a brand new $100 bill for his birthday. Does that figure on the receipt say $36? and 18 cents. I guess I gave him 44 and 15 cents or something near that amount. First, he handed me a $1 bill and then he changed his mind and gave me a 10. I really don't think he meant to hand me the 50 instead of the 20. Dan paid the bill without even noticing that it said $117 rather than $17. Is that bill a five or a 10? There were two or three pennies in the bottom of the purse. All right, new briefs. Actually, they're not new, but they're briefs that we hear that are in sentences. You're going to hear sidewalk, crosswalk, passenger, vehicle, pedestrian, conversation. Here we go, ready? There were several conversations going on. Their conversations always ended in fights. I ended up in two tedious conversations. The conversation was repeated at lunch. Who was present at the conversation? Their conversation was heated and brief. The item made a conversational opening. She replied in a conversational tone. It was a good conversational topic. The pedestrian has the right of way. A pedestrian should walk defensively. She has such a pedestrian outlook. He watched the pedestrians walk by. The pedestrians were waiting there. The pedestrians were on the sidewalk. A flashing light was at the crosswalk. The crosswalk was not clearly marked. Does Linda always use the crosswalk? There weren't any crosswalks there. That intersection needs crosswalks. They ask for crosswalks by the school. Are they putting in new sidewalks yet? The sidewalks were already very slippery. The child roller skated on the sidewalks. Is there a sidewalk on that street? John was in the middle of the sidewalk. The sidewalk needs to be repaired. The passenger gate was closed. Bob was a passenger in the car. I would prefer being a passenger. Passengers should not disturb the driver. The passengers were delayed in boarding. We took three passengers in the car. Where did you park your vehicle? Did the vehicle pass you on the curve? I went to the motor vehicle department. Robert has three classic vehicles. Which of these vehicles is yours? Those vehicles are not suitable. The road is closed to vehicular traffic. All vehicular movement was restricted. Vehicular traffic is prohibited there. All right. I have some legal briefs. You're going to hear indict, D long IT, indictment, D long IMT, injure, J U R, and injury, J I R. Okay, here are your sentences. There was enough evidence to indict him. Did they indict him for arson? The grand jury will indict them. They will indict everyone involved in the matter. The report indicts the board of directors. 
he is going to be indicted for fraud. Do you think he will be indicted? They are indicting all of the officers. The indictment was returned. The jury handed down the indictment. The judge is pleased with the indictment. When was the indictment read? The grand jury issued the indictments. Were you indicted by the grand jury? Mr. Johnson was indicted for murder. They are indicting the president of the company. A rough job like that would be likely to injure him. He will injure Ray if he keeps on that way. She did injure her foot at the time of the fall. The lack of practice will injure your progress. The old program injures progress. Robert injured himself when he fell. They were both injured in the accident. Aren't you afraid of injuring yourself? She had an injury to her legs. The injury was minor. He had massive injuries. The doctor examined her injuries. All right. Moving in to some consonant compounds. And this focuses on initial SW, final FRG, and final GS. And um, this, this is going to be in the form of sentences. I'm going to give you one set with those. And then the next set is going to be uh, emphasizing initial SKR. All right, so I'm going to date it so I know I've given it to you. All right, oops, uh-oh. Hold on one second, I just dated it and lost my spot here. Here it is. Okay. All right, here we go. The swallows cut a swath through the clouds. Two swans swam in the lake. Tom used the sword to swipe at Ray. He swung his sweetheart in the swing. The sweets are swell. He swerved to avoid the swarm of bees. They were referring to the covering on the cot. She was wavering before offering him a position with the firm. Mark was hovering over his wife when she was suffering. He was preferring the deferring of the payment until June. She is favoring your viewpoint. We were savoring the aromas. The dogs tore the bags into rags. When he digs, he finds bugs. The plugs and the pegs were loose. Two hogs and three pigs are in the pen. He tugs and he lugs on the cargo. The price tags were on the wigs. Moving into the second set. He carefully scrutinized the script. She screamed when she scraped her knee. Tad scribbled on the screen. The scribes wrote a note on the scratch pad. His scrabble board is scratched. The scroll was held in place with the screw. The book of poems contained the rhymes. What are the names of the dames? The beams in the rooms of the house are painted white. Cal seems to have dreams every night. The programs included games and mimes. How many times a day do the chimes ring? He honks and winks at the girls. Lynn ranks the banks at the top. The punks were sleeping in the bunks. Two tanks were placed on the planks. The minks were stored in the trunks. She dunks the flax and it sinks to the bottom. All right, I'm gonna give you one more because this kind of goes with what we've been working on. This focuses on initial SN, initial SKW. Here we go. The snake was snoozing in the sun. We sneaked into the snazzy restaurant. The dog snarled and snapped at the stranger. We were snuggling in the snow. The snobby and snotty girl sn smirked. A snort came from his snout. The quad, or excuse me, the squad car squeezed through the traffic. The squire is a square. He squirted water and then squashed the bug. 
The people's plan cripples the economy. Some apples are green. The staples are in the drawer. She was alarmed when he harmed her son. Les confirmed and affirmed the rumor. We formed and firmed up our plans for the summer vacation. He was termed by the doctor as deformed. Luke warmed the milk for the baby. Sabrina was armed and she was, per, or excuse me, Sabrina was armed when she performed the robbery. All right, moving into literary and jury charge. I'm going to start with literary first. We're going to finish up this sheriff's uh, officer's report. We started this last week. All right. All right. Here we go. This is an actual arrest report. And um, it's also, it has uh, some interviews from some of the witnesses. Here we go. Reed was found to have a felony of $125,000 PC number 273.5, warrant number FVI 1005483, and a felony of $100,000 PC 273.5, warrant number FVI 1201045 for his arrest. I paced Reed, or excuse me, placed Reed under arrest for his warrants and for a PC 273.5 spousal abuse investigation. I handcuffed Reed behind his back, and while I double locked the handcuffs, I had Reed sit in the back seat of my vehicle while I finished the investigation with the victim. While on scene, I spoke to the victim about what had occurred and had her show me areas where the incident had occurred. The victim told me the following information. The victim said she and Reed have been married for the past eight months and they have no children together. The victim and Reed started arguing over a blocked, restricted telephone call that she had received. Reed grabbed the victim with both hands and grabbed her arms and took her telephone from her to prevent from calling 911. The victim said on Tuesday, 10-8-2012, at approximately 3.30, Reed woke the victim and told her he had a fucking letter for her. Reed had a pair of scissors in his hand and gave her a handwritten letter from him. See attached copy. The victim's 15-year-old son was spending the night and Reed told her something to the effect, if you scream, I'll kill, or excuse me, if you scream, I'll fucking kill you, bitch. The victim did not scream in fear. She would wake up her son. The victim's Yorkie dog, or York dog, started yapping at Reed. Reed picked the dog up by the neck, and it was possibly, he possibly held the scissors to it. Victim did not know why Reed was upset with her, but thought it was possibly because she did not have sex with him that night. Reed told the victim she loved the dog more than she loved him. The victim said she left on Friday night because Reed was starting to start up his shit. Reed returned on Saturday, 10, 6, 12, at approximately 7.30. The victim said Reed's vehicle was gone, so she returned to get her stuff. The victim brought her aunt's friend, Michelle, with her, and she had parked at the back of the residence. Michelle was inside, and the victim was loading her property into her vehicle when Reed drove up behind her vehicle. The victim started yelling for help, and Reed ran up to her and grabbed her by the neck. Reed pushed the victim down on the back seat. Reed took his pocket knife out and acted like he was going to slash her tires, but he stopped because Michelle was there. The victim did not know Michelle's last name. Interview suspect Connor Reed. While outside the county jail at approximately 5.02, I read Connor Reed, his Miranda rights with my sheriff's department issued Miranda warning card. I asked Reed if he understood the rights I had just explained to him, and he said yes. I asked Reed if he was willing 
to walk, or excuse me, to talk to me about the charges against him. And he said, yeah. Reed told me the following information. Reed said him and the victim have been married since February 5, 2012, and they have no children together. The victim's son was living with them, but moved back out yesterday or the day before. Her son came by this morning and got the rest of his stuff and is now living with his grandparents. Reed said he was not staying at home on Friday night and checked into a Motel 6. Reed stayed in the motel because the victim had other people over at their residence. Reed said the victim was chasing him around that night with the car and he was just trying to get away from her. Reed was just trying to walk away from her and she was just following him in the car. It was near the Motel 6, near the new Target in Simi Valley. Victim kept threatening to call the cops, so he never went to his room and called his friend to pick him up. Reed came back home on Saturday around 11 o'clock because he had given in to her. Reed told the victim he had some money and would help her out. Reed said he never grabbed and pushed the victim down on Saturday. Reed believes the victim is still doing drugs and is still drinking, and she starts in with him about the money. Reed said he never puts his hands on the victim unless she is drunk and starts coming at him first. Even then, he does not have to use force. He is just able to get away from her. I showed Reed the letter the victim gave me, and he said it was not his. Reed said he has not been there. I asked Reed if the writing on the letter was his writing, and he hesitated, but then said it wasn't his. Reed said the victim writes all kinds of crap down. She writes constantly in her book. Reed said he did not threaten the victim with the scissors or to kill her. Reed said he has been staying away from her and she has called and threatened him. Reed said he never grabbed her dog, nor did he threaten to stab the dog. Reed said today the victim threw alcohol at him. The victim came up to him and put her arms around his neck. The victim was biting and screaming in his ear, and he told her to get away from him. The victim kept following him around. The victim didn't hit him, but grabbed around his neck, pulled his head close, and was screaming in his ear. Reed said he has not touched the victim and had not used any force against her. Reed said he would walk away from the victim, and she would follow him. Reed said he did not threaten to flatten the victim's tires with a knife. Reed said the victim has not struck or assaulted him, but has only pushed him. Reed was booked into the custody of the county jail for PC 273.5 spousal abuse and for his two outstanding felonies, PC 273.5 spousal abuse warrants. The victim had several bruises on the upper and lower extremities of her arms, and she complained of pain to the right side of her face. The victim refused, it, refused any medical attention. Reed had a small raised bump to the back of his head, but did not know how he received it. Reed thought that the victim possibly did it to him. I took pictures with a digital camera of the scene, victim, Reed, and of the evidence recovered at the scene. I downloaded the digital pictures into a DIMS at the Simi Valley Station. The victim gave me the letter that she said Reed had written. Victim also gave me the scissors that she said Reed had threatened her with and her dog with. The victim recovered the scissors from the bedroom, bathroom area. I collected the pocket knife from Reed's pants pocket when I made contact with him. I also recorded the initial contact with the victim and Reed, and I recorded the interview with Reed on my digital recorder. I burned the recordings to a CD. I packaged all of the evidence and I placed it into evidence at the Simi Valley Station. See CR3 evidence property report for additional information. The victim was provided domestic violence information along with the Vine information. Submit the case to the Simi Valley District Attorney's Office for review and prosecution. All right.
Moving into some jury charge. And the subject here is criminal. Okay, here we go, ready? Now this one, I, I am going to read this. Um, I'll read this at 200, okay? Since I read the last one at 180, I will read this at 200. Here we go, ready? If the court or counsel make any reference to matters of evidence which does not coincide with your own recollection, it is your recollection which should control during your deliberations. The verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In other words, your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view to reaching an agreement if you can do so without violence to individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but you are to do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if you are convinced it is erroneous, but do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight and effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of other jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. Remember that you are not part partisans. You are the impartial judges of the facts of this case, and your sole interest is to ascertain the truth from the evidence that has been presented here in court. The evidence must establish the truth of the fact to a moral certainty, a certainty that convinces and directs the understanding and satisfies the reason and judgment of those who are bound to act conscientiously upon it. However, if, after canvassing carefully the evidence and giving the accused the benefit of reasonable doubt, you are led to the conclusion that the defendant is guilty, you should so declare by your verdict. You will arrive at your verdict by applying to these rules of law the facts as you determine them to be. All right. How are we doing on time? 32, okay. I've got one more before we start our Q&A. This is called Verdict of the Jury. All right. There we go. Ready? And again, I'm gonna read this at 200. Your Honor, we have reached a verdict in this case, People versus Oliver Henry O'Rain. We, the jury, in the above entitled action find the allegation against the defendant, Oliver Henry O'Rain, that in the commission and attempted commission of the offense, as contained in count one, that a principal in said offense was armed with a, four, a firearm, to wit, a handgun, said arming not being an element of the above offense within the meaning of the penal code section 89575.3, true. This 15th day of April, 2014, Samuel M. Huffman, foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is your verdict. So say ye one, so say ye all. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Oliver Henry O'Rain, not guilty of the crime of attempted robbery in violation of section 1298.3, penal code of the state of New York, as charged in count two of the information, this 15th day of April, 2014, Samuel M. Huffman Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is your verdict. So say ye one, so say ye all. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Oliver Henry O'Rain, not guilty of the crime of attempted robbery in violation of section 1298.3, Penal Code of the State of New York, as charged in the count three of the information. This 15th day of April, 2014, Samuel M. Huffman Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is your verdict, so say ye one, so say ye all. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Oliver Henry O'Rain, guilty of the crime of assault with intent to commit murder in violation of section 450, penal code of the state of New York, a felony, 
against Robert Quincy, a police officer, as charged in count four of the information. This 15th day of April 2014, Samuel H. Huffman Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is your verdict. So say ye one, so say ye all. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Oliver Henry O'Rain, guilty of the crime of robbery in violation of Section 418, Penal Code of the State of New York, a felony, as charged in count one of the information. This 15th day of April, 2014, Samuel M. Huffman Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is your verdict. So say ye one, so say ye all. All right. Moving in to our q and I'm going to start off with just a one page. I'm going to read this once at 180, again at 200, and the last time at 225. All right. All right, so this is going to be plaintiff questioning and it's strictly plaintiff, the Q and they only, all right? And you're going to hear client, activity, subscribers, imprinted, estimated, incapable. All right, so the first time will be at 180. Were the dots and dashes being imprinted on the tape at this time? Right on the tape, they could refer back to the tape and it would tell you the whole story right there. How many tapes were there on the board that you monitored? I just take a rough guess, really. Was there one tape for each client on the board? No, it just ran continuously. One tape would cover everything. Was there only one tape coming out of that one board that you monitored? Right, and that would cover all of the subscribers on the board? Right. Do I recall that you estimated that there were approximately 50 subscribers that were on that board? It depends on what board they put you on. Some boards had more, some boards had less. Was there anything else that you had to watch on that board besides the tape? I had enough trouble with that one. I couldn't take care of anything else. Did the tape run at various speeds depending upon how much activity there was? It all sounded the same just running right through. There had to be a tape coming from that board at all times, or the board would be incapable of sending signals? Yes. All right, so this time we'll be at 200. Were the dots and dashes being imprinted on the tape at this time? Right on the tape, they could refer back to the tape and it would tell you the whole story right there. How many tapes were on there on the board that you monitored? I just take a rough guess, really. Was there one tape for each client on that board? No, it just ran continuously. One tape would cover everything. Was there only one tape coming out of the one board that you monitored? Right, and that would cover all the subscribers on that board? Right, do I recall that you estimated that there were approximately 50 subscribers that were on that board? It depends on what board they put you on. Some boards had more, some boards had less. Was there anything else that you had to watch on that board besides the tape? I had enough trouble with that one. I couldn't take care of anything else. Did the tape run at various speeds depending upon how much activity there was? It all sounded the same, just running right through. There had to be a tape coming from that board at all times or the board would be incapable of sending signals? Yes. All right, last time at 2.25, here we go. Were the dots and dashes being imprinted on the tape at this time? Right on the tape, they could refer back to the tape and it would tell you the whole story right there. How many tapes were there on the board that you monitored? I just take a rough guess, really. Was there one tape for each client on that board? No, it just ran continuously. One tape would cover everything. Was there only one tape coming out of that one board that you monitored? Right, and that would cover all the subscribers on that board? Right. Do I recall that you estimated that there were approximately 50 subscribers that were on that board? It depends on what board they put you on. Some boards had more, some boards had less. Was there anything else that you had to watch on that board besides the tape? I had enough trouble with that one. I couldn't take care of anything else. 
did the tape run at various speeds depending upon how much activity there was. It all sounded the same, just running right through. There had to be a tape coming from that board at all times or the board would be incapable of sending signals. Yes. All right. Moving into <clears throat> some four voice, a uh, plaintiff will be questioning, but the court and defense jump in as well. Okay. So you are going to hear the following words. You're going to hear George Cummings, Mountain Pride, Vegetables, Washington, D.C., Frank Taylor, Bill Delgado, Sherry Elliott, uh, Food Basket, Perimeter, Competition, Composition, Ken Donaldson, Isles, Gondola, Cashier, Box Boy, Packard, End Caps, Butcher, Dump Bin, Ken Donaldson. All right, and plaintiff is questioning. Now with this one, I'm going to start this one at 180 and work my way to um, 200. And then the next one will go to 225. Okay, here we go. Mr. Clary, do you recall about what time during your shift that day that the accident involving Mrs. Packard occurred? I think it was between seven and eight. I haven't got an exact time, I can't remember between 7 and 8 p.m.? Yes. Were there any other employees on duty besides yourself on that date approximately at that time? Yes. How many? There was a box boy and two cashiers. Do you remember their names? One of them was Ian Taylor. I'm not sure if the other was Dylan Donaldson. Sherry Elliott was also on duty. On this date, May 11, 2014, those were the only employees besides yourself? I'm pretty sure that's correct, yes. There was a meat man, but I'm not sure which butcher was working the department that day. Was he somewhere back in the meat department? Yes, I guess. Please speak directly into the microphone, Mr. Clary, so the court reporter can hear you. Okay. Do you know if any of these people have left the employee of Albertsons? No, they haven't. They are still all there. The ones I just said, yes. Do you know the store number there? Yes, it is 720. Do you have a specific way of referring to the Albertsons located at 4301 14th Street in Washington, D.C., 14th Street or 720? From now on, when I refer to this store at 4301 14th Street, I will refer to it as the 14th Street store. Okay, please answer clearly with a yes or no answer. Yes, okay, Your Honor. At the 14th Street store on or about May 11, 2014, was it a practice to stack cases of canned goods for display purposes at the end of the aisles? Yes, it was. Who usually did the stacking? Bill Delgado, the store manager. Does anybody else besides the manager stack the cases on the end caps? I do, and also the third man. Okay, go ahead. At the time, we were all involved in setting up the merchandise displays. Who was the third man at the time? David Cummings. I will show you a photograph that was taken immediately after the incident. I will show I will show it to counsel first. Yes, I am familiar with this. Okay, the photograph is marked on the back as plaintiff's photo number 1C. Were these marked for identification? Yes, Your Honor. I will ask you to take a look at that photograph. Do you recognize what it depicts? Yes, I do. What does it depict? An end cap display of Mountain Pride mixed vegetables. What location in the store was this display? At the end of the aisle, aisle 15. As far as north, west, east, or south, where is aisle 15? It's at the south end. It's near the south exit in the store. When you say end cap, what are you referring to? The gondola or the table. These are the tables. It's a long gondola with shelving all around. Okay, now with respect to this photograph, the cans of Mountain Pride vegetables are displayed at the end of the gondola, is that correct? Yes, they are. Would you describe the composition of this entire display? 
the gondolas are three cases wide, approximately four cases possibly, five cases, I can't tell by this photo, high along the back of the display. Let's go to photograph 1B, which appears to be a clearer picture of the same display. And again, was this marked 1B previously? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I've seen it. Now you said the cases that appear in front of the bin were not there on the date of Mr. Packard's accident. Well, again, please speak up, Mr. Clary. If you are not sure, just tell us that. I'm trying to think. At that time, they may have been there, but generally this isn't a practice to display merchandise cases in tiers of six cans. But they may or may not have been there on the date of Mrs. Packard's accident. Is that correct? That's right. The usual manner that the customers take the cans when they shop from that display is to take them out of the dump bin. Okay, please look at Plaintiff's 1B, referring to the cases that are stacked on the back of the gondola, the very bottom case of the stack. What is that case resting on? Other cans or on the bin? In this particular display, I would say it's on the bin itself. By looking at the photograph, 1B or 1C, are you able to tell whether it's resting on the other cans or on the bottom of the bin itself? From the size of the case, I would say it would be on the bin itself. I am almost positive that three food cases will fit inside the bin, especially the way they're set. It is so far from the perimeter of the wall. All right. Moving into another q and I'm going to read this at 2.25. And again, plaintiff is questioning, but defense jumps in as well as the court, and then it does go over to cross-examination. So then defense takes over. Okay. All right. Let me give you a word list. You are going to hear Mrs. Delaney. Peter K. Marshall, Miami Beach, Anonymous, Perkins, Municipal, Photostatic, Elliott, uh, Memorial Day, Monroe, Darwin, Florida, Extremity, Inlaid, Miami Beach, Daylight. All right. You're also going to hear envelope, which is initial N, final FL. You probably already know that. All right, so this will be read at 2.25. Here we go. What is your full name, sir? Peter K. Marshall. What is your occupation? I am Chief of Police, City of Miami Beach, Florida. Directing your attention, sir, to May of this year, were you employed in that occupation? Yes, I was. And on Sunday the, Sunday, the 31st of May, did you have occasion to go to your front door? I did. Will you tell the jury what you discovered on that occasion? On the inlaid brick steps of my porch, I found an envelope with my name and address on it. Did you open that envelope? Yes, I did. What was in the envelope? An anonymous letter. Did you read the letter? Yes, I did. Now directing your attention, sir, to the 3rd of July of this year, did you testify at a preliminary hearing of Mr. Darwin, Mr. Elliott, and Mr. Perkins involving this same matter? Yes, I did. At that time, did you examine that letter and envelope? Yes, I did. Was that letter and envelope either entered into evidence or as exhibits in the courtroom? I believe they were. Now going back to the 31st of May, after you had received this letter and envelope, did you turn the envelope over to any other individual? The following morning, I turned it over to Captain Moore of the Miami Beach Police Department for comprehensive investigation and further action. I have here, sir, a letter addressed to Mr. Peter K. Marshall. It is a photostatic copy of a letter. I ask you to examine that, sir. Do you recognize the contents of the letter, sir? Yes, I do. What letter would that be? The copy of the letter I received on my porch on Sunday, the Sunday morning in question. I would like to introduce this as plaintiff's exhibit next in order. Are you moving for identification? Yes, I am. Thank you. Mrs. Delaney, this copy has attached to it plaintiff's exhibit B1. I assume this was in the court. That is right. It probably should be taken off unless I think it should be taken off and we should proceed under our own markings to avoid confusion. 
Well, I think so too. The only thing is, I think the record should show that this was People's Exhibit B1 in the proceedings of the preliminary hearing in the court in Miami Beach. And I will remove the exhibit marked page. Very well, Your Honor. It will be received and marked Plaintiff's Exhibit Number One for identification. I have here a photo of what appears to be an envelope addressed to Mr. Peter K. Marshall. I ask that you examine that and see if you can recognize that. It appears to be a copy of the envelope that the letter was received in. Okay, I would like to introduce this for identification next in order. It will be received and marked people's number four for identification. That is all of the questions that I have. Okay, counsel, thank you. Chief, about what time of the morning was this? I believe it was about eight o'clock. Was it daylight then? That is right. When had you previously used your front door? The previous evening. About what time? I really don't recollect. Probably before midnight. Did you return home at that time? That is right. Now when you returned home, was the porch light on? It usually is. Was it on that night? As far as I remember, that would be Memorial Day evening then. Saturday Memorial Day, May 30. That is right. When you came home, did you come home alone? I really don't remember. I doubt it very much though. My wife is usually with me if I am out in the evening. Now my recollection is that you just have one step on your porch, is that right? There are two steps, two steps. Where was this letter when you first saw it? As I recall, I believe it was on the top step. Now was it close to the door or was it close to the outside extremity of the porch? That I don't really recall. Did you come out to pick up the paper that morning? That is correct. Where was the paper? On the sidewalk about 10 feet in front of the steps. Okay, toward the driveway then, right? That is correct. Were you alone when you found this letter? I was, and you disposed of it the following morning then, is that right? That is correct. You kept it in your possession all that day? Yes, I did. And that evening, did you keep this letter in your possession? Yes, I did. Your Honor, I have nothing further at this time. I would like this witness to remain on call. All right. I'm going to switch transcripts and uh, read from the one that we've been working on. And uh, this is with uh, First American Title Company. And defense is questioning. Here we go. I'm going to read this at, um, I'm gonna read this at 200 because I feel like it is a little bit more difficult. Okay, all right, here we go. What are the documents that appear to be found on pages 10 through 17? Those are photocopies of our general index that the documents are compiled in, and those are references as to what documents are contained within those indexes. Would this be a geographic index? Yes. How is the geographic index set up or maintained? Again, it's found by looking for a geographic index on a particular block that you are searching. Yes, block for a reference to lands, the LDS. All right, now page 10 has an underline with a date, 125.14. What does CTF mean? That is just a reference for a certificate of sale, as in certificate of sale. There are a lot of documents that come under different headings, but it's just a beginning of a word or a phrase that would have the word certificate in it. What does the information and remarks signify? That's just our title plan codings in the type of document or information that would possibly be contained within it. What does the letters PT signify? A portion. A portion? Just the word portion of block 181. And the word sale, what does that signify? A sale of something that had happened. Okay, is any of the writings on page 10 in your handwriting? No. The next number, there are a number of entries following the one you've just read. Am I correct that they all refer to the same property? They all refer to documents that would possibly affect block 181 of that geographical index. The blue numbers circled, are those page numbers? That's where the document would be found, yes. Following page 17, there appears a number of documentary, state type documents, which include legal descriptions, etc. Are these documents that are pulled from other files by the searcher to be placed in the packet? Those are pulled out of the geographical index. I will warn you, Terry, that I prepared a copy of that for you. I don't know that it will be a good copy, while one copy is a copy of the copy already, although it's our original file. What's the significance of the document of page 59? 
that is, depending on the type of search that we are doing, it is just other information that we would add to a report and it's just coded accordingly. Well, it had circled there are no deeds conveyed within the last six months. Does that mean that someone has gone to a public records source to see if there are any recordations on this property within the last six months? Yes, you went down to the county recorder or is that within your own information? No, First American has copies of all of the documents recorded daily. So there appears to be maps, is that correct? Yes, are these maps to your knowledge, all of the maps that were in existence at the time the title search was done? Yes, I have arrived at a pink sheet with a small page taped to it. What is the pink sheet? When a person requests that a search be started, that's the sheet that the information is taken down as to the information for the search. Is this in your handwriting? No. Do you have any knowledge as to who completed this page? No. You do not recognize the handwriting. It could, well, yes, I do. All right, whose handwriting does it appear to you to be in? Possibly Kelly Young or the chief title officer. Is there anything on the form which indicates who filed it out? No. Off the record, do you have any recollection of ever seeing this page prior to today? Other than at the time that I examined it, and at the time of the report when it was searched. This page says, taken by Tom Powers. Does that signify that you are the one that received the order from Mr. Brandt? No, that's just the reference as to who would be holding the title order. There were many people within our office who can open an order and that just represents the one title officer who it would be. Are the other order numbers in sequence at First American? Yes, they are. Are they kept in a central place so that each officer assigned an order number? How are they kept? How do you determine what order number to use? Well, there is not. There is just a packet that's given to each title unit within a numerical sequence of orders. As each request is made of us, we just pull one out and assign that order to it, the order number. Would that be fair? A fair conclusion? An order number with the next number in sequence would have been taken an order would have been taken about the same time as this order within a day or so, yes. Do you know what the words notes called 3.45 p.m. mean? When the order opened, there was a request that a previous search had been done. You know, order number 1162042, and that's the date that the notes were called to retrieve that start. What does the words notes reference? A prior preliminary title report. Is there someone there named? I think that's him. Okay, what? The word him? I think so. It's not my handwriting. It could be 90. Please give him a call when it's ready. That's what I would assume from the sentence. All right, do you know who the writing on the white sheet that's attached to it is assuming that it's someone different? Some of it is mine. The others I don't recognize. What portion is yours? The reference to recollection. It says recollection of all the items above are DA. Is that correct? Yes. What does DA mean? It doesn't affect, or doesn't affect, what does doesn't affect mean in the terminology as you used it? What is an item which it doesn't affect? Something that wouldn't have any bearing on the property. Okay, was this a response to a request that was asked in the black ink above it? Do you remember? I really don't remember. Okay, what are the items above that are referred to? You could possibly have been no telling. Okay, off the record, back on the record. This phone order sheet, I guess we ought to make this one an exhibit. Do you want to go Xerox it? Yes. The only problem is I'm happy to have him guess and speculate, but it is evident that he didn't prepare it. The only part that he is really competent to is his own handwriting. He can talk about general procedures. I do. This phone order sheet says present owner, question mark, J.E. Wetson, Inc., or it could be vested in Oscar G. Tritt or both. Do you have any recollection of the names Wetson and Tritt having been considered as possible owners of the property? No, certainly the fact that their names are shown on the phone order as well as the front page brief signifies that you would have considered them as possible owners. Is that correct? Consideration should be made. That is the best basis for the name search. Is that correct? Right. Do you know if a name search was done as part of the preparation of the packet? Yes, there was. How do you know that? You turn to another page in the packet, it's gold. It has the same order number in the upper right-hand corner. It has the words about the top center of GI run sheet. What does that mean? General index. 
Is any of the writing on this gold GI run sheet in your handwriting? No. This sheet does signify that the names shown on it were all considered or searched. That is considered, yes. All right, what does that mean then to have a name considered so we know what we are talking about? It depends on the searcher. If he feels like running them, running means what? Well, actual doing the search of the name. For instance, as names are put on, then nothing had to be done. Yes, there has been times that our searchers in haste or negligence or whatever might put a name down. You said as long as the names are put on, nothing has to be done? No, no, counsel. That's what was read back. That's what he said. That's what you said. Let the record reflect there has been a rereading of the sentence of the witness, which included the phrase, nothing had been done. We're now trying to determine whether that was stated as the reporter put it down. Did you say, what did you say? Do you recall? The names have been put down, but nothing has been done. Sometimes, all the time, sometimes. All right, do you have any knowledge in this case whether any of these names were run or were not run? We have to take it on faith that, in fact, the searcher did that. Is there any way that searcher indicates he did it? He just dates the report of his run if he has, in fact, done it per the plant date. All right, what does, what do the code numbers shown respectively mean if you know? When we do a name search, there is a system called a Russell Soundex code that our geographical, our own general index is based on. It's a coding of the individual's last name, and accordingly, we go to the records and search it based on the Russell Soundex code. Could you spell Russell Soundex code? R-U-S-S-E-L-L, -S -S -E then S-O-U-N-D-S-E-X, -S -S I believe. Sound sex, S-O-U-N-D-E-X. All right, does the entry of the code mean that at least the searcher looked up the code that designated the person's name? Yes, then the column subcode, number one, what does that mean? Well, some names are so familiar as Smith or Jones or Taylor that they would have their own individual portion of our index that we would search. Sub portion, yes. Okay, can you tell us whether a sub portion even exists without even actually searching the name or running the name? No, does the fact that there is a reference to a subcode strongly suggest that the searcher actually went to the subcode? No, it's just that he was able to identify that the name was under a subcode. All right, is there any way to identify without searching the name or running the name? No, the form and the date signify what dates they own the property or what. Those are the dates that the searcher had run the names within the time frame. Okay, now across from Beach Coach Specialties, there are no dates shown. Does that signify he did not run the date that time or that name? I don't know the answer to that. You don't know whether there are no dates shown? Right. Does the absence of dates have any common meaning in First American's plan? No. Across from Jane Landers are the dates 2 -1105. Then what appears to be a letter D as in dog. Is that correct? Right. That would be the D would represent the date of the plant that they ran it from 2-1105 to the plant date. Okay, do you see that? Yes, I do. Go ahead and use that, counsel. Okay, thank you. Now, apparently, the searcher signifies that he, Oscar Tritt, to February 11th, and then something that he saw led him to go and run Jane Landers from February 11th on. Is that correct? I don't know what he was thinking at that time. All right, GI means what? General index. JDGT means what? Judgments. The checks have what significance? Supposedly, those are the checks and the books that he checked. All right, do you know what the significance of the numbers on lines 24 and 5 are? No. Is it true that pages have been added to the packet that existed at the time the actual search was or the preliminary report was completed? No. Any other unnumbered document was submitted to our office after the date of the search? Okay, that's correct. All right. What are these five, eight and a half by five pages? Those represent a tax search of the property. How is that accomplished? By the tax assessor parcel number. Are these computer runs of some sort? Yes. Do you have an in-house, do you have in-house computers that give you the information? Yes, we have our own software. Do these specify whether the taxes have been paid on the property? Yes, they do. Do they specify who is paying the taxes on the property? It would specify who the county has deemed an owner or possible owner of the property. Next, there appears to be a copy of the actual preliminary report. Is that correct? Yes. 
you would have attached the lender's appraisal document. Is that correct? That's a supportive information of the search, yes. All right, so that concludes our Upper Speeds Live class. Have a wonderful evening.